the nudge of the Holy Ghost, what is it? It was certainly picked up by Philip. We have this word that he heard in the depth of his being. Go up and join this chariot. And he hears. In those days, as we know from classical literature, even as late as St. Augustine, people read aloud. Indeed, we have echoes of that in the Apocalypse. Blessed is he who reads and hears, and the word for reading in Greek has the root of ana, up. So ana legobai, one reads upwards, audibly therefore. It's fairly recent in human history, relatively speaking, that one identifies reading with reading only with the eyes and the mind. The proof is that we have one or two early texts which make a clear distinction and they have to make a point if that's actually what's going on. And the fact that he's reading a Hebrew text and wants to know its meaning indicates the depth of his goodwill. This is a man of affairs responsible for the treasury of Queen Candace of Ethiopia. Of pagan origin therefore, but having a clear intuition that there is greater truth in Jerusalem. And this journey in a chariot in those days is something else. And so we need to admire this man. And we see therefore why the Holy Spirit is very interested in this goodwill of his and he's largely recompensed. <coughs> he doesn't know the meaning of what he's reading. People are often confused by a scripture without a commentary. The commentary has to be also the correct one, the voice of the church and the context of the scripture, which is salvation history, the people of God, and therefore also the church. You know what happens if one presumes upon one's personal interpretation. But Lectio Divina is not a manipulation of scripture to make it say what we want it to say for us. It's adoration of the word the word present on the page in a different form from that of the tabernacle, but truly present also. It is good to have a place in one's abode where scripture is enthroned. It can be on a nice white napkin, surrounded by flowers, before an icon, and a living light before the icon, and that can be an angle of prayer where we come to hear, to be touched by, to be in an ambit which is not of this earth. A way in which heaven can claim that portion of earth in the domestic church for its own. As it happens, I have with me still by my bed a very simple triptych which I was given years ago in Austria, in a monastery. And it has followed me around a long time. And in the monastery, when I was ordained, it was likewise at my bedside and would be the focus of quiet prayer in the cell. <coughs> the scripture was before it, simply placed on a little white cloth. And therefore, again, when I see it, it reminds me of past graces. These little things count. They are human sacramentals. And there are little journey to Jerusalem where we make an effort and where we also are recompensed. Philip then was used, but he was usable and available. 
and we need that openness to the promptings. We can sharpen them. We are too well programmed sometimes to be interfered with by the Holy Spirit and we might yet at that point be needed and someone will have missed us and therefore God's grace because we were already programmed so well that the real need wasn't known or felt or heard. In the Gospel we have not unfortunately that same goodwill. The Lord is indicating that his listeners are not taught by God in the same way actually as the followers of Moses were. The expression comes down to us as docibile's day, docile of God, taught by God. The word docio, which is to be found in European languages, in anything to do with teaching and learning, comes also through in the word docile. A person who is docile is taught. He learns. The hardened heart deflects both grace and knowledge. This notion of being taught by God and therefore coming to the Lord is fairly central. But it also extends to the notion of docility in general, linked with precisely the picking up of the nudges. If one looks around the planet, one sees how the interchange of conversation is different from one culture to another. In meridional lands, things are more expansive where gesticulation enters into it and the tone of voice goes up and down. There's much waving of arms and anything else which might be useful to make a point, even on the telephone. In Britain it's far more interiorised. In Wales and Ireland it's somewhere in between. In French they make a lot of use of the unexpected word. Quite clever actually, the understatement. But in whatever society and culture it might be, <coughs> the bottom line is, is there docility? Unfortunately, if one observes life, one sees that relatively few really have the gift. Relatively few seem to be truly taught and able to pick up things on the spiritual level, even in human conversation. It is far more profound, the art of really picking up things than people actually presuppose. One can pick up much of a soul by observing and letting be. But it presumes the capacity to be worked upon as one is engaging in conversation. As in the divine realm, it presumes that element of being able to be worked upon and therefore not being so well programmed that we are a huge barrage. Alas, many souls go through life not knowing that they are heavy. It has been said that people are either a drain or a fountain. But those who think they are fountains sometimes are drains. Let us ask this grace of being able to hear how much pain we cause by our incapacity to feel the pain that comes out of us.
but are too much talking and inability to engage with the dead.